Good morning, Johnson Ferry. It's great to worship with you, and what a privilege it is every Sunday to come together as the people of God to worship Jesus and to fellowship with one another. I want to welcome everyone in our uh, sanctuary. And I know this time of year, with summer, we got people traveling uh, all over, so we want to say hey to all of our beach campuses and lake house campuses and European campuses and wherever you are. Uh, in this day and age, you can take us with you, and we are grateful to have you uh, online as well. If you're a guest today, we know, hey, somebody, uh, every Sunday is somebody's first Sunday at Johnson Ferry, and if you're a guest, hope that you'll look in uh, your welcome guide and see a couple things for you. One is that next week is our Explore gathering, and that's designed for you. We'd love to have you there just to help you learn more about uh, our church and how to take a next step here. And also, we provide an outline if you want to take notes with us today that might help you to follow along with today's message. Uh, we're in the book of Judges, as you just saw, and today we're looking at Judges uh, chapter 3. And as you're turning there, uh, today we are going to look in depth at one of the most famous left-handers in the Bible, a southpaw. Now, I don't know if we have any left-handers here today. I feel like I should put my left hand. Any left-handers here today? All right, lots of left-handers. Um, I have a daughter. My oldest daughter, Madison, is a, is a left-hander. I, I looked up some fun facts about left-handers. You may know this. I didn't know this. Apparently, that's decided in the womb, which is kind of amazing that children, even in the womb, decide which hand they are going to prefer. Uh, left-handers are unique. Uh, left-handers, there's more men left-handers than women left-handers, which is interesting. Um, there's been eight U.S. presidents who were left-handers. Left-handers uh, recover from strokes faster than right-handers, for whatever reason. There's lots of studies done about how left-handers use more of their brain. That's why a lot of left-handers um, claim to be more intelligent than right-handers. Uh, I think a left-hander actually did that study based on... Uh, left-handers left struggle... This is interesting. I didn't know this. They struggle to roll their tongue like that. Like, if, like a lot of left-handers apparently struggle to do that. But as a right-hander, no problem. All right, so... Actually, there's a Latin word... For left-hander, and it, it's our English derivative, sinister. We talk about somebody being sinister. Uh, that often means of the left hand. And we're going to look at someone in the Bible today that some might look at as sinister, but certainly he's the man that God used, um, as he does often with all of these judges or deliverers. And his name is Ehud, or Ehud, depending on how you mispronounce it as an American. I'm going to go with uh, Ehud. So Ehud is a man that we're going to uh, be introduced to in Judges chapter 3. This summer, we're looking at the book of Judges. We won't be able to cover every single verse in this book, but I do want to encourage you to be reading through the book of Judges. That's my challenge to you. At some point in the summer, read through the entire book one time. And it's a dark book. It's not uh, a PG book, if you will. Sometimes we take these stories and we sanitize them a little bit and make them feel a little bit more palatable to our modern day senses. But there's a lot of violence, just there's a gruesomeness to some of these stories. But there's a lot of lessons that we can learn today too. And in fact, after we walk through the entire story, there's a couple lessons I think we can learn for putting this into practice in our day and time, and we'll get to those in just a minute. But it is our tradition here when we read the Word of God to stand together. We're gonna be up for a little bit today, so if you guys would stand, Judges chapter three, I want to read the whole story, or at least this story of Ehud, uh, in verses 12 through 30 of chapter 3. And so you may stand a little bit longer than normal, but let's just listen to this story, and then we'll break it down and teach and apply it. Judges 3, chapter, I mean, verse 12. Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered to himself the sons of Ammon and Amalek, and he went and defeated Israel, and they took possession of the city of the palm trees. And the sons of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, for 18 years. But when the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud, the son of Gerah, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man. And the sons of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. 
Now Ehud made himself a sword which had two edges, a cubit in length, and he strapped it on his right thigh under his cloak. Then he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And it came about when he had finished presenting the tribute that Ehud sent away the people who had carried the tribute. But he himself turned back from the idols which were at Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And the king said, silence. And all who were attending him left him. Then Ehud came to him while he was sitting in his cool roof chamber alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he got up from his seat. Then Ehud reached out with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. The hilt of the sword also went in after the blade and the fat closed over the blade because he did not pull the sword out of his belly and the refuse came out. Then Ehud went out into the vestibule and shut the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. When he had left, the king's servants came and looked, and behold, the doors of the roof chamber were locked. And they said, undoubtedly, he is relieving himself in the cool room. So they waited until it would have been shameful to wait longer. But behold, he did not open the doors of the roof chamber. So they took the key and opened them, and behold, their master had fallen to the floor dead. Now Ehud escaped while they were hesitating, and he passed by the idols and escaped to Sarah. And when he arrived, he blew the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. And the sons of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was leading them. Then he said to them, pursue them, for the Lord has handed your enemies, the Moabites, over to you. So they went down after him and took control of the crossing places of the Jordan opposite Moab and did not allow anyone to cross. They struck and killed about 10,000 Moabites at that time, all robust and valiant men, and no one escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land was at rest for 80 years. Whoa. Now you see why I titled today's sermon, How Ehud Helps Us Get the Point. Wait, there it is. All right, took a second. There it is. All right. Let's pray together about this crazy story. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, Even uh, an odd story like this points us to Jesus. It reveals something about our own hearts, and it gives us um, lessons in truth, belonging, and purpose, the things that we ultimately find in Jesus. Help us, Lord, to know those things and apply those things today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have a seat. So Judges is a fascinating book, um, largely because where it fits in the narrative of Israel. If you knew the Bible, you may not know this. If you've been walking with Jesus for a long time and read the Bible, you do know this. But right before the book of Judges is the book of Joshua. Now that's the book where God finally brings his people into the promised land. He had been promising it through Moses and even Abram long before Joshua was alive. But Joshua is the one that God picked to take the Israelites, cross the Jordan, and finally come into the promised land. And you remember the very first city that that they overcame, and they didn't do it by their own might or by their military prowess. They did it through the might of God. Remember he said, walk around this city seven times and blow the trumpet, and they did, and the walls came tumbling down. Anybody remember what the name of that city was? Jericho. Now Jericho is also called the city of palms, which is exactly where this story takes place. And we are to see really a tragedy in this story. The very same place that God showed his might and power and gave victory to his people is now a place of bondage for his people. And it's all part of this cycle that occurs several times in the book of Judges. Many scholars have given this cycle using different words. For our purposes this summer, we're gonna use a description that I learned 20 years ago and it's just stuck with me. And he uses an acrostic using A, B, C, D, E. And we see this over and over again in the book of Judges. And here's the cycle. If you want to write it down in your notes, you can. Uh, The A stands for apostasy, where the people turn their back on God. The B stands for bondage, in the sense that because they turn their back on God, then they are put into a place of discipline and bondage. 
At some point then, they see, cry out to the Lord, and God hears their cries for help, and then D, he gives them a deliverer in the shape of a judge, a warrior, and after that deliverer comes and victory, or at least temporary victory is achieved, then there is ease in the land. So apostasy, bondage, cry out, deliverer, and ease. And on one hand, you look back and you look at the people of Israel and go, how could you guys just keep getting in trouble? How could you keep turning your back on the Lord? How could you keep being placed under bondage? And then like me, you look in the mirror and go, oh wait, that's me too. Because even as a follower of Jesus, it's still easy to get trapped into sin and still live as though we are in bondage to something other than Jesus Christ. Jesus is the ultimate judge. He is the ultimate deliverer. And like all scripture, this ultimately points to Jesus to do what even these human judges could not. But in the book of Judges, we have at least in a temporary way, God giving these deliverers, these judges. We think about judges being you know, men and women wearing a black robe, overseeing some um, case that they are adjudicating. But here in the book of Judges, the judges are not so much, um, like we think, of, think about judges today, they, they are warriors, they are deliverers, men and women. There are 12 of them in all in the book. We're gonna look at five of them this summer. And in each instance, we see how they point to Jesus in some way, even if his name is not anywhere in the text. But they also reveal something about our own lives and our own hearts. And we can learn that in this story today. So let's take the cycle, the A, B, C, D, E, and just lay it on top of this story, go through it again, and then let's draw some implications for our life today. So let's start with the A, apostasy. And if you go back to verse 12, you see this. Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, apostasy, turning your back on God, which is just tragic, is it not, that these very same people who a generation before witnessed God's firsthand power and his miracles to bring them into the promised land find themselves now serving the Baals and the Ashtaroth, these temporary pagan gods instead of the one true God. And that's the temptation of idol worship. The true God says, my benefits are usually long-term, but the pagan gods were all, always about short-term gratification. God's standards were high, high morality, high ethical standards. Here's the bar I'm raising for you. There's a better life I have for you than the one that everyone else is living. No, 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 but, but pagan gods were often like, no, just do what feels good in the moment. The true God says, I want you to look out for your neighbor, sacrifice for your neighbor, Go above and beyond for others. The pagan gods, no, no, take care of you. It's all about you. What's right for you? The book of Judges might be summarized in the very last verse in the entire book, Judges 21, 25, that says, now there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And that's what's so appealing about idol worship. It feels right, but it's a rightness that is based on your own eyes, your own standard, instead of the standard of the God of the universe. So the people turn their back on God, and God brings about B, bondage. And we see that in the second half of verse 12 through 14. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered, this is Eglon, he gathered to himself the sons of Ammon and Amalek, and he went and defeated Israel, and they took possession of the city of the palm trees. Again, the city of the palm trees is what city? Do you remember? Jericho. They took possession of Jericho. And the sons of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, for 18 years. Where is Moab? Let me show you a map. You can see here, you can probably find this in the back of your Bibles as well, but there to the southeast side of the Dead Sea, you see Moab. And we see that the Moabites came around the, the Dead Sea up to the top where the Israelites had once crossed over the Jordan. And there were this little confederation of the Moabites and the Amalekites and the Ammonites. They, they all took over the Israelites and set up shop 
in Jericho or the city of Palms, which is again tragic because this is the place where God had once showed his hand in victory and yet now God, now this is an important point, God strengthened the hand of Eglon. God wasn't tricked, he wasn't fooled, this didn't happen because Eglon was such a great military leader. No, this happened because God is purposely putting his people in bondage to teach them the lessons that he wants to teach them. The Moabites now are in charge and they're led by a man whose name is Eglon. Eglon, the, the, the Hebrew word Eglon, it, it literally means, it means round. He's a round man. Uh, he, he, it might also mean cow or heifer or bull. Uh, this is a big man. Uh, this, is a, this is a man who shopped in the husky section as a kid. I don't know if you remember that, shopping in the husky section as a kid. Now, you might think, now, why is, why is the Bible picking on this guy? I mean, it's, it's not nice to call somebody a fat man. And this is not just some kind of juvenile humor that's happening here. No, no, there's a point to this. In this day and time, very few people are overweight. Now, that's hard for us to imagine because in our day and time, we have ample amount of food and it shows. But back in the day, it was hard enough to just barely live, let alone eat enough to, to become overweight to the point where it was obvious to everybody else. And yet here you have this man that's overweight, but why is he overweight? This is a key question to the story. He's overweight because Israel is taking their tribute, which was a grain offering, and instead of giving it to the true God in sacrifice and worship of the true God, they're giving it now to this Moabite king named Eglon. And his fatness is a judgment on Israel. The reason that he is fat is because he is eating what ultimately should be given to God and yet it's given to him, which is a tragedy. And it says that they were in bondage for 18 years. There are teenagers living in this time who might be 16 years old. They've never known anything but to have King Eglon at the top of the heap. So this bondage is there, and then there's C. They cry out, verse 15. But when the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them. Ehud, the son of Gerah, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man, and the sons of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. Now let's stop here. They cry out to God and God sends them a deliverer. Now I know sometimes it's easy to read the Bible and go, well, hold on, it seems like in the Bible there are two gods. I mean, the New Testament, he's so lovey-dovey and, and forgiving and, and welcoming and, and all that. But then you read the, the Old Testament and it's like God is mean and angry and vengeful and wrathful and well, you know, what's up with that? And I would say the only reason you would come to that conclusion is if you've never actually read the whole Bible. Because what you see in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, over and over again is that God gives another chance and another chance and another chance and another chance. Here, the people of God who have witnessed his miracles are now in bondage because of their own sin. And yet again, as they'll do in this book, cry out to God and God once again shows his grace and gives them a deliverer. And as he will do again and again in the book of Judges, this time he does it through the most unlikely of judges, a man by the name of Ehud. Now, what do we know about Ehud? Well, we know certainly that he is left-handed. Now, the, the Bible literally says that he was restricted to his right hand. It doesn't say he's disabled, but it's not a bad Assumption, simply because we'll see that he's given a private audience with the king. This is a man that no one else would think is a threat in any way, shape, or form. And yet this is the one that God uses. And there's great irony here too, because Ehud is a man who's a left-handed man, and yet he's from which tribe? Do you see which tribe he's from? Benjamin. Now, do you know what Benjamin means? It means son of my right hand. Isn't it ironic that the man who can't use his right hand is from the tribe of the son of my right hand, and he's the most unlikely person, yet he's the person that God would use. Did you know that God can use you even when you don't think he can? Sometimes we tend to discount what God could do through us because of our own weaknesses, our own disabilities, and yet, and yet 
you might be the very person that God wants to use to help change the world. Ehud, this is his, this is his moment. This is the underdog moment. This, this is like, uh, it's like Rudy. Remember Rudy, the movie? Kid plays for Notre Dame. He's got one play, right, to, to justify that he can be out there with the giants on the field. This is Ehud's moment. Well, let's just read what happens in the story and how this deliverance comes about. It says that he made himself, in verse 16, a sword which had two edges, a cubit in length, and he strapped it on his right thigh under his cloak. A cubit was about 18 inches from your uh, elbow to about the tip of your fingers. He probably actually made this one up to about his knuckles, about 16 inches. It didn't have a cross section, so it was more like a dagger than a sword. And where did he put it? He put it on his right side. That's what a left-hander would do. But now see, in military formations, you were taught to fight with your right hand. Why? Because you would fight in formations. You would fight with a sword in your right hand and a shield in your left. And so when you would line up in a row of soldiers, everyone was protected on their flank with their left hand and they were offensively fighting with their right hand. That's how you, that's how you learn to fight. And yet here's a man who can't use his right hand. So where does the left hander put his sword? He puts it down on his right thigh. And it says that he takes the sword with him. So he has a premeditated plan here. And he, verse 17, presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. And of course, we see that Eglon was a very fat man. I wonder if, I wonder if Eglon, I mean, Ehud always brought the tribute. I wonder if he was picked for just this year and this was his one moment or perhaps because he's a disabled person who everyone else overlooked, they let him do this year after year. We don't know. But he goes to do what he does. Again, this tragic scene of, of all these people collecting all these grains that should be offered to God, but instead they're carried off to give to this pagan king in, in Jericho of all places. Well, he goes to do his, his duty. And it says that when he finished presenting the tribute, it must have taken several of them to carry all those grains and vegetables and, and the like. And, and he had sent away the people who had carried the tribute. And it says, interesting in verse 19, he himself turned back, now look at this, from the idols were it, were, which were at Gilgal. So the idea is that he was walking back home with these people, but then he got to Gilgal. Now Gilgal is the place on the Jordan River where the Israelites crossed over into the promised land. And if you remember from the book of Joshua, when they finally crossed over, after all these years of wandering in the desert, they finally crossed over, and Joshua said, we can't forget this moment. We have to do something to symbolize, to memorialize that God was at work here with his people. And you remember he set up 12 stones? these memorial stones that every time the Israelites would, would look at them, they would be reminded of the faithfulness of God. And yet, we don't know what exactly Ehud is looking at, but he gets to Gilgal, back to the river, and, and he probably sees two things. He might have seen those stones there, and it was a judgment that instead of the people of God worshiping the true God, they were now worshiping and serving this pagan fat king, Eglon, and perhaps he also saw these pagan idols that the Moabites had set up in this sacred place. And at that moment, he turns around to do what he had determined to do, and he gets back to the king. And he says to the king in verse 19, I have a secret message for you, O king. Now, who doesn't love a good secret? I'm sure Eglon loved to get secret. You know, when you're in charge, when you're the king, you, you begin to get on an island. And you don't know who you can trust and you always think someone's out there to get you. And maybe he's wondering, do I have a spy in the palace? Is there a military coup that's coming my way? Does Israel want to give more tribute? What, what's, this, what's the secret? And perhaps because Ehud is a man that others overlooked and thought wasn't much of a threat, Eglon, Eglon thought, I'll be fine to have a private audience with this, with this Israelite. And so he, he sends away all of his guards and, and goes, and, and they leave him. And then in verse 20, Ehud comes to him while he was sitting in his cool roof chamber alone. Now, again, we have to pause just to make sure we understand what's going on. Back in those times, you would often have a house where you would entertain people on the front, you know, on the, on the, 
on the ground floor, but often you would build a cooling chamber, a roof chamber on top of the roof, more for private audiences, time alone. It was a place where in a very hot place, breezes would come through and it was just a more comfortable private place. It's also a place, we just have to admit this, it's a euphemism also for a bathroom that people would use. So in some ways, this is his second throne. <laughs> Anyways, but uh, he goes up to the top of this roof chamber and there he lets Ehud come and have an audience with him. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And then here's the climax of the scene. Ehud reached out with his left hand. Remember, he's left-handed, so no one's thinking about it. From his right thigh, he takes the sword from his right thigh and he thrust it into his belly and the hilt of the sword also went in after the blade and the fat closed over the blade because he did not pull the sword out of his belly and the refuse came out. Man, what a story. He, he, he sticks it in there. Now, modern day swords are fullered. And what that means is that they have a kind of a beveled edge so that there's not this suction that's created. So if you, if you put it in something, you can easily pull it out. But his is just a flat blade. So when he, when he now you need to know this stuff if you're ever gonna impale a king, this is important. So, so he, he, he takes his left hand and he gets and he thrusts it in there. And, then, and you, you see all this detail that the fat came over the sword and this refuse came out. And you think, this is gross. Like, why is this, why is this even in the Bible? And here's why. You are seeing the lifeless death of idolatry exposed for what it is. Here's a man who, because of idol worship, had grown fat off of the service of Israel. And here his fleshly fatness is being exposed for what it is. And the refuse came out. Now, of course, this could be a reference to his guts or his bodily waste or something else, but of course it created a stench, which providentially God would use. So we keep reading. Ehud in verse 23 went out into the vestibule and he shut the doors of the roof chamber behind him and he locked them. Now we don't know how much time passed between verse 23 and 24, but at some point the guards who had been dismissed, figure we need to go back and check on the king. It, we, it's been a while since we've heard from him. And so in verse 24, when he had left, the king's servants came and looked and behold, the doors of the roof chamber were locked. And they said, which is the natural assumption because they didn't hear Ehud, they must thought he was long gone. Undoubtedly, the king is relieving himself in the cool room. Now, does everyone know what that means to relieve yourself in the cool room? Just making sure, okay. Uh, and of course they smelled something coming from the door and they probably thought he's relieving himself. Now it's, it's a little bit humorous because we don't know how, how long it passed and I just wonder what the conversation between the guards was like, you know? Do we go in there? <laughs> it stinks, I know. How long has he been in there? I don't know, check your sundial. I don't know, how long, how long has he been in there? I don't know. So some time passes. And it says, eventually they had to just check it out. So it said, they waited, I love this diplomatic way of saying this, they waited until it would have been shameful to wait longer. Isn't that a wonderful way of saying that? But behold, he did not open the doors of the roof chamber. So they took the key, opened them, and behold, their master had fallen to the floor dead. He was dead. And then in the next few verses, it's like when a football team intercepts a pass and then the very next play, the offense throws this huge Hail Mary pass to capitalize on the momentum. It's like that's happening here. Now, this fat king has died and it's like the head of the snake has been chopped off. And now the people of God and the strength of his power will defeat them. So we just read that in verse 26. Ehud escaped while they were hesitating and he passed by the idols and he escaped to Sarah. And when he arrived, he blew the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim and the sons of Israel went down with him from the hill country and he was leading them. And he said to them, pursue them for the Lord has handed your enemies, the Moabites over to you. So they went down after him and took control of the crossing places of the Jordan opposite Moab and did not allow anyone to cross. They struck and killed about 10 10,000 Moabites at that time, all robust and valiant men. Now, pause. Many of your translations have used words like that, 
robust and valiant. But did you know that's the same exact word used to describe someone being fat? Interesting that he passes the idols, gets the men, and then they kill all the fat men. You see the layer of meeting happening here? That this idolatry, this fatness that they had accumulated off of the people of Israel is now being put to death. No one escaped. So we walk through the D of deliver and then finally the E of ease in verse 30. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel and the land was at rest for 80 years, 80 years. Isn't that a story? At first you're thinking, what, what, what is the lesson from that story? Which is simple, no guts, no glory. That is the, just kidding, that's not the lesson from that story. Certainly as, as New Testament believers living on this side of the cross, we wanna see how every text in some way points to the finished work of Jesus. And though Jesus' name is never on or in this text, we certainly see parallels, do we not? Ehud was the most unlikely of deliverers and Jesus, of course, is the most unlikely of deliverers, at least from a human standpoint. People laughed at Jesus on the cross. People thought, what a fool, if you were really God, you would get down from the cross. And yet, as Paul would also say, the cross is foolishness foolishness to people who are perishing. I can't believe you guys are gonna stake your whole life on some dude that died 2,000 years ago on, on a piece of wood. And yet he said to us, the, those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And in the most unlikely of ways, Jesus Christ did everything needed that we might have our sins forgiven, that we might be given the righteousness of God and that Jesus died for us and not only did he die for us, but now because of his resurrection, Jesus through his spirit lives in us, not just for us, but in us. And even a text like this reminds us of the unlikely power of the gospel. But as we look at these characters, I think there are even further lessons we can learn about just living in a certain way. Again, we wanna be people of truth, belonging and purpose in Jesus. And that, that describes a lifestyle. And these aren't just mere moralistic actions of things to do, but in light of what Christ has done, in light of the gospel, in light of the finished work of Jesus for our salvation, it, it shapes how we live. And there are lessons that we can learn. Here, here's a few, write these down if you will in your, in your welcome guide. I think a few notes from the different people in here. Like, let's talk about number one, the lesson from Israel. What's a lesson we learned from the people of God? God disciplines his people. God disciplines his people. Now, we don't like to think about God disciplining his people. We often think, if I become a follower of Jesus, then life will get easier, life will get better. All these problems in my life will go away. That's what, we, that's what we want to say. Hey, just follow Jesus and he'll make everything great in this life. And he does. But we also know that we have a God who will often discipline his people so they become who he wants them to become. Look at this cross reference in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses seven through 11. I'll have it on the screen. It is for discipline that you endure God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which you have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them. Shall we not more be more subject to the father of spirits and live? For they, meaning our earthly fathers, they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems not to be pleasant. And all the kids said, amen. But painful, yet to those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. I think this is important to think about and we don't have time to develop this, but sometimes when you go through hard things in life, it's not always because of the devil. Sometimes it's because of God. He disciplines his children to help them be the people he wants us to 
be. The lesson from Israel is that God disciplines his children. It's easy to look at a story like this and go, well, isn't this God's judgment on America? Or God's judgment on Russia for what they're doing? Or God's judgment on China for what they're doing to the world? And yes, there are other scriptures that, that relate to God's judgment over nations, but our primary application of this should be God's judgment to his people. And in what ways do we, as his people today, deserve his discipline? Those are lessons to be learned from a story like this. Well, here's another lesson, a lesson from Ehud. Our weaknesses are pathways for God's strength. Our weaknesses are pathways for God's strength. So many times we discount how God might use us. I'm not good enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm not a good enough leader, uh, yeah, I've made mistakes in my life, I'm a sinner, I've, you know, all, all, I'm just, all the shame we heap on ourselves. I, you know, God would definitely never use me like he might use you or use you or you would never, he would never do. Did you know that no one would have thought he would have used Ehud either? This weak, possibly disabled person that others overlooked, this was the very person that God used to at least in a temporary way, deliver his people. Notice what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians as it relates to the makeup of the New Testament church. For consider your calling, brothers and sisters, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. He's saying, hey, that's the church. Like, this isn't like the elites, right? But God, verse 27, has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the that which are strong and the insignificant things of the world and the spies God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are so that no human may boast before God. It's not about your power, it's about God's power through you, amen? Uh, Joni Erickson Tata, paraplegic who God has used in, in amazing ways to share the hope of the gospel with so many people. One time she said about her own suffering, she said, the greatest good suffering can do for me is to increase my capacity for God. Our weaknesses are pathways for God's strength. Well, what can we learn from Eglon? I would say it this way, beware greed and gluttony. In many ways, we often sacrifice what is ultimately God's and give it to the Eglons of our life. But sometimes we are like Eglon. You might think, well, we don't, we, don't, we don't worship statues and idols like they did back then. That's not really our temptation nowadays. And maybe we don't worship statues, but we have plenty of false idols that we worship all the time. You say, well, how, how is that? Well, what is an idol? Let me ask you that. Two quotes, I think, get to this. Uh, Dick Lincoln, a former pastor of mine, said this, anything other than God that you allow to condemn you or exalt you is an idol to you. Tim Keller said this, an idol is anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, anything you seek to give you what only God can give, anything that is so central and essential to your life that, that you should, and if you should lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. If anything in your life other than God fits that description, it is an idol. And Eglon was obsessed with his own greed and gluttony. And, and I wonder if there's a challenge to us as followers of Jesus today, maybe to live more of a, a life of radical simplicity, not getting caught up and keeping up with the Joneses and the greed and the gluttony of our world and, and just depending more on Jesus. Jesus said, I take care of the flowers and the birds and you're way more valuable to me than them. I'm gonna take care of you. And I think there's a lesson that we learn from Jesus. It's more implicit than explicit in the story, but this would be the fourth thing. What's the lesson from Jesus? It's this, give your way out of greed. In other words, be generous. The, the way to the way to defeat, if you will, the power of greed and materialism is not just to think, I don't wanna give in to greed and materialism, it's to actually give away and be generous with what God has given to you. Now we talk about that at church and we're grateful for your gifts here, but this is just a lifestyle everywhere. Are you generous 
with what God has given to you? Or are you like Eglon, accumulating the fatness of your materialism that will one day be exposed for what it really is? These are lessons that we can learn and more from crazy stories like this story in Judges chapter three. But as we're gonna see all summer long that we are trapped in this cycle, but there's one who can defeat the cycle and his name is Jesus. And I would just ask, have you turned to him? Have you repented of your sin and put your faith in Jesus? Do you believe that he's the son of God and that he died on the cross for your sins, that your sins might be forgiven and that because of the power of his resurrection, you might have death after life, you may have abundant life and you not only believe that Christ died for you, but you know that Christ lives in you because of the power of the spirit. That is how the cycle of sin is broken, to turn to Jesus, the ultimate deliverer. I'd love to pray for you this morning. And if that's the decision you need to make, please make it. Father, we just give this time to you and we just pray, God, that you would take a story like this and Lord, teach us, convict us, guide us in whatever way you see fit, Father. Lord, thank you for your grace. This story displays your grace in in some unusual ways as you give your people so many second chances. God, thank you for the grace that you give us through Christ. Thank you for the permanent deliverance we have in him. And Lord, I pray if there's someone here today who's never turned to Jesus, who's never said yes to Jesus, who's never said Jesus is first in my life, would today be the day that they would come to salvation and find not the temporary ease of 80 years like Ehud brought, but would find the infinite eternal ease that comes through Jesus. God, would you work in that way and help us to build our life on you. We love you, Father. We thank you for what you're doing with your people. And we'll pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.